Well, it started like this. When I was liberated on May 5th, 1945, I didn't know really what to do. I worked on a German farm, and I had no idea what to do with myself. I didn't want to be on the German farm anymore, but I, had, I didn't know where to go after this. So I, stayed, I still stayed on with the Germans. I still did my chores, milked the cows, uh, cleaned horses, etc., etc. And 10 days later, one of the Polish girls said, enough is enough. Let's leave the village and walk wherever. We don't know where, but let's walk. We'll probably meet other survivors, other refugees. So we did it. I came to my German family. I said, I'm leaving them. And they were in a terrible shock because they expected Maria to stay with them all their lives already. So they were really in a terrible shock and angry at me that why should I leave, etc. But I explained to them that I'm young, I want to look for more refugees, and perhaps with them together I'll be able to go back to Poland. So they gave me even food on, for the road, sandwiches, etc., etc. And we started to walk, and indeed we walked, and we started to meet other peoples. They told us there is a new camp, a Polish camp formed. There are already 10 people there in a private house in a certain place. And we took the train, we got there. I can't remember those places because there were so many. Till I got to Landsberg, there were maybe eight other little camps on the way. So it's difficult to remember. And then I guess we had no name. The camps had no name, but they were like, 15 people in one group. Then we heard there is more people gathering, Polish people gathering in another place. Well, we took the train, we went there, and there were 25 people. Then there were 50 people, etc. until I came to a camp where there were 10,000 people. It's called, it was called Wildflecken. And they were French, they were Italians, they were Russians, they were many Poles. And everybody was sick. Everybody was sick. They didn't have enough food for us. They used to make the coffee in the same boilers where they made soup in the afternoon and never washed them properly. The result was that this, we had dysentery. And only an American soldier saved my life. I was very sick. He used to bring me white bread from the army camp, a Polish-American uh, soldier whom I met, whom my friends met. So after a while, we used to hear that from there there will be transports. The Poles will go back to Poland, the Russians back to Russia, etc., etc. And indeed, it didn't take long, and uh, different groups started to leave. I stayed in, in a room with 12 Polish women, also with my friend with whom I spent a lot of time during the war together. Her name was Yadja. And uh, interestingly enough, the women were really very nice. They, we, we cooperated. If I found a little bit of food, we shared it between ourselves. And one day, walking, a young fellow approached me, and he said, you are Jewish. I resented it terribly, living for so many years as a Christian and intending to be a Christian till the end of my life. I resented the fact that he recognized me. And he pointed to me, he took out, stretched his arm, and he said, you see the triangle and you see the number? The triangle means I'm Jewish. The number means I was in a concentration camp. And if you are really Jewish, you'll be smart. We are already 30 Jews here, and we have a lot of food. We steal cows from the Germans, and we have meat, and we have... Anyway, I pretended I wasn't Jewish. And then he said, if you intend to join us, we are already 30, we have a leader by the name of Joe Buddha is his name, uh, then you'll come to block number B. And I didn't know what to do. I was tempted to join the Jewish people, thinking maybe eventually I'll get to the States or to Israel. I really had no future at all to Poland, perhaps go back to Poland, where I left good friends. I didn't know if I'll find them. But you know, you, all kinds of things go through your head. And one day I decided, yes, I think I belong to the Jewish people. 
But how do you tell your friend with whom you share a bed together, with whom you share bread, every piece of bread we used to cut in two? We were, uh, really, we went through bad times together. How do you tell her that you want to, to join the Jews? So I said, one day I said to her, you know, Yadja, I want to talk to you, but I cannot talk to you in the room. Let's go to the fields. Not far, there were fields. I came to the fields, and I said to her, I have to tell you I'm Jewish. She fell on me and started to kiss me and hug me. She said, I'm Jewish too. <laughs> we lived for so long together. I never suspected her to be Jewish. She never suspected me to be Jewish. We fell, we cried. It was just hard to believe. Really. It was very emotional. And we decided to join the Jews, the Jewish people, the group of the Jewish people in camp. Once we joined them, indeed, they had many friends, like American soldiers used to come because they had their Jews in this camp. Still, the American army was stationed all over, all over Germany. They didn't go home yet. So when the Jewish people heard that there are Jewish people in this camp, they started to come frater fraternize with us, etc. One day, this, and they had a dynamic young man. Suddenly, he became the leader of it. I don't know how. And he said that there is, he heard of a Jewish camp somewhere in, in Munich, near Munich, and there'll be a transport of us. They'll transport us there. And indeed, it didn't take long. They came with big military, the Americans did it, with military transport uh, trucks. And they loaded us, and they brought us to this place. Oh, we were long on the road. We stopped in different places till we got there. And finally, they took us to a place which was called Landsberg am Lech. That was before there were SS barracks there. It's a tremendous place, tremendous place. And it was a real big camp, and there were many, many Jewish people there from everywhere, even from Russia. And young, I didn't know from where they came, all those Jewish people, all survivors. The first people who worked in this camp were Englishmen. They had a big, they had a building, they had the headquarters, and they were people from England. When, so I heard that they were trying their best, but also it was, we didn't have enough food. The first few days I slept on the floor, Yaj and I, until they, uh, we found a little room for us, with, we shared it with other people. It was really very difficult. And for weeks I was walking around with a German-English dictionary. I wanted to study English. Previously I had, when I was a kid, 10 lessons of English in Warsaw. And somehow I felt I needed English. You know, I didn't know, I never knew that I'll wind up in Canada, that I'll really, really need English. But out of boredom, I used to walk around with a German-English dictionary and study English there. And one day I walked in into this building and there was a very nice English guy with the uniform of the English army set. And I said to him, you know, I don't know what to do with myself. Just waiting three times a day for the soup, for the uh, soup to, and the bread to get, for the mess hall to open, maybe you can employ me. He said, would you like to be a switchboard operator? I said, yes. He said, we're going to have three lines here and I'll show you how to use them in a week's time. Come a week, in a week's time. I came a week later and he showed me how to use the three lines. And I start a work there. No special benefits, nothing. It's just that I knew I had something. It was good to have work. And it didn't take long and they disappeared. And suddenly three guys appeared. That was Mo Aspler. Uh, Dr. Throw and Dr. Glasgow, and we heard that the three big guys from Andra arrived to reorganize the camp. So that was good news. The English guys disappeared overnight. And uh, while I was sitting at my switchboard operator, uh, as a, uh, at the switchboard, Dr. Throw comes in, introduces himself, and said, I want you to be my secretary. I got scared. I don't know any English. He said, "Ich will dir lernen. I will teach you. Don't you worry. I want you to be my secretary." What languages did you speak at that time? I spoke Yiddish. I spoke German. I spoke Polish. 
you know, German, I studied at school. And Yiddish, I spoke at home a little bit. And uh, Polish, naturally, I was educated in Polish. So in and English, I knew a little bit, but not really enough to work as a secretary on this guy who came, you know, beautiful uniform, gorgeous looking fellow. And I got really scared. I said, well, you have to give me 24 hours. <laughs> he said, okay, I'll give you 24 hours, but I want you as my secretary. That was the best thing that happened to me in my life. Anyhow, I agreed to the job, and, as, and I started to work for him. People we were coming with different problems, and we had to solve them. And he really was very interested in helping the refugees. At the same time, I had to work with Mo Aspler. With Dr. Glasgow, I really had very little to do, but Mo Aspler and Dr. Sroll, we, Mo Aspler used to come to me for certain letters. He needed more gasoline from the American army. He needed a few other things. He used to, I used to type the letters for him. And uh, Dr. Sroll also used to, um, he was very interested in improving the people's life while in camp. How could he do it when we didn't have enough soap, we didn't have enough rooms for all those refugees? Every day people were coming from different parts of Germany, even from Russia refugees were coming at that time young people, I don't know how. And we couldn't cope because we never had enough rooms for those people, enough place. So we had a big problem on our hands. The situation wasn't good. So Dr. Sroll, at that time, luckily enough, the American army was still stationed around Germany, around Munich, and he wrote a big manifesto that he sent out to all the English, uh, uh, to the American, um, government, the American headquarters, stating that the Jewish people are still in camps after the war, something has to be done, that we have to improve their, their lot, we have to give them more food, we have to give them soap, we have to give them shoes for the children, we have to have supplies of sugar, etc., etc. As a result, a big delegation at that time in charge of the American forces was um, General Bill Smith. He came one day with a big army of jeeps with uh, all kinds of um, journalists, photographers, and Dr. Sroll gave a, um, how do you call it, an interview. Yeah, an interview. a press conference. A press, com yeah. a press conference, what we know. And, uh, and that was really something special that we, uh, we appreciated. We had all kinds of people working. We had, in my own office, with Dr. Sroll, we had a fellow by the name of Misha Zaks. We had Yadja, my friend, help. There was uh, also a woman, a fabulous woman from Inc. Many, we, we were called second class Andra. Downstairs in the office, there were typists that used to work. Everybody had these people secretaries, etc., from the, from, like myself, from the refugees, you know? So there were quite a few people working there in the office. Every, there were different departments. I was in the welfare department. There was the, um, my husband had his department, which is the motor pool department. We had to have supplies for 7,000 people, don't forget. My husband was in charge, and at that time, gasoline was scarce, really. So it was very difficult. Working there was quite difficult, but we needed to bring potatoes. We needed equipment for our art school. We needed so many things. And there were many people, want, many people wanted to work. They just didn't feel like walking around doing nothing. And because so many, and we had even schools. We opened schools for children, nursery schools. We had teachers right away. We had a hospital. And uh, we had a few very famous, later became extremely famous doctors in Israel. We had a mikveh even in our, uh, because people were so anxious to start life. Young couples would get married, they had to go to the mikveh, otherwise they wouldn't get... We had even a rabbi in our camp. We had people from Belgium, from England, two women from England, working as Anra, Miss Nye and Miss Geffen. And then we had quite a few women from the States. And we even had a fellow from Czechoslovakia, Dr. Korn, who was also with Andra. So everybody lived in this big building. 
And then, as I said, they found this fellow who was a capo in a concentration camp and they wanted to kill him. Somebody did rescue him and we put him in jail. And there was a court later. We had this judge, famous judge. He was a judge in Lithuania before the war. So we did have a few people that we had to put on trial there. It, it, it's a bizarre story how the, really, the survivors wanted to live so much. They wanted they tried to lead a normal life. But in conditions like that, you could not lead a normal life. So the result was that some, 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 some people started to travel somehow around Germany because they couldn't travel farther than and buy watches and sell watches or bring gold and suddenly you could buy, people would approach you walking on, in our camp, you want a ring, you want this, you want that. They started black marketeering. And that was in our, in, in our camp. What form of exchange was that? Cigarettes, cigarettes, whatever. If you had a few dollars, if you made a few dollars, some people had money, I don't know why, from where, don't ask me, I really don't know. <laughs> But I remember that I wanted to buy a ring from uh, one of the guys from England. You know, we had two guys from England in Anra. And uh, he wanted uh, two packs of cigarettes, although he had his own PX, you know. My husband used to get his PX and everybody. But he wanted from me a carton of cigarettes, and I didn't have, and I couldn't get the ring. <laughs> then later, later, when I met my husband and I married him, I said, I like to buy some uh, certain things because we had nothing. We were anxious to get things. Oh, you'll come to Canada. You'll have plenty of this. Never got me a ring in Canada. <laughs> that was the cutest story. But anyhow, it was black marketing. And that's when we decided that the young people needed a North School, that something has to be done to save them. And slowly, slowly, people started to look for relatives. Then when I started to work, the Dr. Throw and Mo Aspler. Mo Aspler used to come to my office more often and more often. And what they did for us, the only reward for our work was that the Andra House, which was a beautiful house, uh, used to have every Friday night dances for the Andra personnel number two. And I was the Andra personnel number two. And my husband used to invite me to dance. So all the girls were always angry at me. Why is he inviting only you and not us? So I, I said, I don't know, but he liked me, and we yeah. liked each other, and that's how we started a romance. The Anra house was outside of outside camp? Outside of camp, okay. yeah. It was in the village of Landsberg, not far. Beautiful village, by the way, beautiful. But um, that was outside the camp where they, this fellow had a mansion, really, a mansion. And uh, they lived there, and they used to come to camp. And they, they had jeeps all the time, you know, they oh, had their own transportation. Yeah. And so on. So later, my husband proposed to me, and I was very fortunate that I accepted. I had a fabulous, really, husband all the time. And uh, he was very anxious to leave camp. He was very frustrated there because it was difficult to work in such conditions. You know, he also supplied trucks for Aliyabet, as I told you. And that he was always struggling to get more gasoline, more gasoline. In order to get more gasoline, he had to invite the American personnel. And with the Russian boys, put a lot of whiskey on the tables. And, uh, you know, the, the Americans cannot drink. The Russian guys from Russia were fabulous drinkers. They will take a bottle of vodka and pour down their... Uh, the Americans tried to do it and find they were under the table, lying under the tables, under the chairs. And then my husband would put in front of them to sign something because he needed more gasoline or more potatoes or whatever. And that's how we got a lot of stuff done, you know, through this. And when he got married, he felt he had wanted to start a, a normal life already, you know, rather home, back home. So we were married in April. And in September, my husband made an application. April of what year? April 1946, 11th of April 1946. And uh, we left. Uh, we left in uh, November 1946. The camp, and we started to travel. We traveled for three months all over Europe. My husband didn't have to pay for his travels as an UNRWA personnel. And the interesting thing is that we had to take a ship. It was the Aquitania from Southampton, London, yeah. 
and that was the first UNRWA personnel, uh, United Nations personnel, going to New York. That was docking in New York. And there was also Madame Simpson and the Duke of Windsor, and we had uh, really very interesting people on our uh, voyage. So we docked in New York, and then after, after my husband wanted me to meet my family, so uh, we went to Baltimore where I met my aunt, uncle, and their children. We went, I had a lot of family in Long Branch, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So first we, we traveled all over the, my family, just we wanted to meet the family. And then we came here to Montreal to, to, so I could meet his family.